All right, well, I've done this particular event, for the, this is my fourth time. The first year I did it, we did a panel on the litigation over states' attempts to restrict minors' access to violent video games. One of the outcomes of the case, of course, is that the court said that the First Amendment does, in fact, protect video games, and therefore there would be a high bar before states could actually restrict anyone's access to them. And most of the people who read the case at the time, I'm sure, were focused on that issue, and fair enough. But there was an interesting implication to the court's holding for other areas of the law. So what I'm going to talk about today is not video game violence or states' attempts to restrict access to violent video games, but two cases about another topic where the First Amendment plays an important role, or at least potentially plays an important role. The question is, after this case, are video games being, are, are they going to be given the same degree of creative freedom as people who make films have, or people who make TV shows have, or people who write books? One of the ways in which all of those other producers of media have creative freedom is that they can incorporate into their works the trademarks that you see out in the world in order to tell their stories. That doesn't mean they won't get sued. Sometimes they do. That doesn't mean that sometimes they'll decide a license is a better way to go because a particular trademark holder is known to be litigious. But the general rule is that if you're making a film or making a TV show, writing a book, a newspaper article, and you wanted to incorporate a trademark into the work. It's part of the background. It's a car that somebody drives, a product that somebody needs to hold because people need to hold things. You can do that without permission. And the handout here has a list of many of the recent cases involving that sort of issue. And you'll notice that the media defendant tends to win these cases. They keep coming. But generally speaking, the media defendants win these cases. So that's one area that I want to talk about today with regard to a particular case that's pending right now in the Southern District of New York. The other area is the use of real people in your works. When a filmmaker wants to tell a story about a historical figure, ordinarily the filmmaker can do so without permission. Now again, that doesn't mean they won't necessarily ask. Sometimes you'd like the cooperation of a particular person. Sometimes you'd like the cooperation of someone's estate. There can be value in that. But the general rule is that you can incorporate real people into your works, even if they're fictional, and you can do so without permission, at least if you're making a film or a television show or writing a book or putting an article in a newspaper. But what about in a video game? So I have another case for that. All right, but I'm going to start off with the case involving trademarks. This is the case that's pending right now in the Southern District of New York, AM General versus Activision Blizzard. Now, AM General is the trademark owner of the Humvee. And everyone should know what a Humvee looks like, but here are some images, if you don't recall, of what the Humvee looks like from the complaint that AM General filed. They have registrations for some of these marks, so I don't doubt that AM General is a legitimate trademark holder, holder in the Humvee and the trade dress associated with it. The problem in this case is that the Call of Duty series incorporates the Humvee into an awful lot of the games. So here's the question. Does AM General own the portrayal of contemporary military stories. Now, of course, it's not framed that way in the case, but ultimately that's what this case is about. Because AM General actually acknowledges, and of course they play this out, that the image of the Humvee is iconic, and I agree with that. Just as the Huey helicopter is iconic for Vietnam and essential for telling a story about Vietnam, the Humvee is essential for telling any story that you would want to tell involving contemporary military events, because it's such a standard part of the scenery. If a filmmaker had to come up with some alternative to the Humvee and have people drive around in World War II era Jeeps, even though they're supposed to be in 2018 Afghanistan, that would look ridiculous. If they had to design their own vehicles, that would be extremely costly and it wouldn't look very realistic, so it would undermine the, the realism that the filmmaker is trying to create. But what about a video game maker? AM General's position is that this is trademark infringement. It's a violation of the Lanham Act, 43A at least, maybe other provisions, but what it all comes down to, even though there are multiple causes of action, at least for the video game, there is also an issue involving some toys, but at least for the video game, 
The issue, as framed by AM General, is whether or not the use of the Humvee represents a false endorsement, a communication to consumers that AM General or the trademark owner of the Humvee has approved or authorized the use of the Humvee in the games. And according to AM General, consumers value this, which is something similar to what the owner of the Huey helicopter IP said in the case involving litigation over the Battlefield game series, Battlefield Vietnam, for example. It said consumers will think that if the Huey shows up in the game, that we have approved the use of the Huey helicopter in the game, and consumers value that. Now, I want to be very specific about what this means because I, I don't actually buy it. So, when you're trying to decide what movie you want to see, you've got two choices on a Friday night. Which movie shall I watch, A or B? Have you ever thought to yourself, I wonder what product authorized its appearance as a product placement deal in film A and in film B? Did Coca-Cola provide approval and maybe pay to show up in film A? Pepsi film B. I tend to like Pepsi approved films. <laughs> Pepsi is the Gene Siskel of product placement individual or entities, product placement uh, buyers, I, I suppose we call them. Um, no one does that. No one cares if the Pepsi or the Coke that shows up in the film is there due to a licensing deal. Now, ordinarily, you may not care at all that it's there. Sometimes, though, it has some artistic relevance. So in the film The Road, at one point, if you've seen this post-apocalyptic movie, uh, where the world has basically disintegrated for reasons that aren't clear, it's an environmental disaster, it's a nuclear war, it's not clear. But everything has gone very bad. A father and son are traveling along, trying to get to a better place. At some point, the father and son come along to a vending machine. The father gets a Coke out of it and gives it to the son and describes it as a, a treat for him. Now. <clears throat> The Coke works really well in that scene. It's not just product placement, although Coke did end up approving it because the filmmakers got a little nervous and asked for permission. But the Coke works there for an artistic reason. It's designed to draw a connection between the world that used to exist and what the world is like now. So it's much more meaningful than if he had pulled out a can that said soda on it, a generic can that just says soda. That would not have worked in that scene. What works, though, is the most popular and iconic soda brand in that scene. I don't, I don't know if Pepsi would have worked. I think, it, I think Coke was really the only choice that made a lot of sense. So it was there for artistic reasons. Sometimes it's there just for product placement reasons. But this is here for artistic reasons. It's relevant to the game. It's relevant to creating a realistic, modern military scenario. So if you need AM General's permission to have this in your movie, or your television show, or your game, that means you can't do modern military themed stories without AM General's permission. Now, should a defense contractor have a veto over stories told about modern military history? I would lean towards no. Um, I would think we don't need them to have a veto over these stories. And in fact, there's very little consumer value in giving AM General that kind of control, because whether AM General has approved this being here or not is not going to affect any purchaser's decisions. That doesn't mean endorsements are never worthwhile. Endorsements may be very valuable. George Foreman says, I endorse the, the grill. That may be valuable. When he endorses another product, he may say, well, I like the last thing George Foreman endorsed. I may like this thing. But that's not going to apply here. I doubt very much that there's a single consumer, unless they worked for AM General, who bought this game and thought, oh, great, AM General approved this. Or at least they must have or it wouldn't be here. That's the mark of a game that I'm going to like. That just isn't going to happen. So how does this case get resolved? Well, we're still in the very early stages. The complaint was filed. Uh, it was filed in um, November 2017. There was an attempt to transfer the case from the Southern District of New York out to the Central District of California. Now, why would the video game maker, why would Activision want to transfer the case out to the Central District of California? Well, because Activision is out there. The studio that made the game is out there. And it's because Ninth Circuit precedent is really good on this particular issue. So there's a split among the courts about how to answer the question of when the First Amendment will trump a trademark owner's right when a trademark is used without permission in an expressive work, like a book, film, video game, or any other expressive work. So we're not talking about advertisements. We're not talking about competing products. 
It's not that I sold my toothpaste and put Crest on it in order to mislead consumers into thinking I'm the product that they've been familiar with. This is a use in an artistic work. Now here's the problem. Both the Second Circuit, which is the circuit that includes the Southern District of New York, and the Ninth Circuit, in theory, had the exact same test for answering this question of when the First Amendment trumps the trademark owner's rights. In application, though, they take very different approaches. And the handout here is the summary of the different approaches that the courts take. And the Ninth Circuit itself has not even been consistent on this. But here are the different approaches. If you follow the original case that established this test, it's called Rogers versus Grimaldi. It's a case from the Second Circuit out here. It says that sometimes, oftentimes, the interest in free expression has to prevail over trademark rights. When? When a trademark is used in an expressive work, the First Amendment will protect that use unless the trademark use has no artistic relevance to the work or the work explicitly misleads consumers about the relationship between the maker of the expressive work and the trademark owner. So there are two prongs, artistic relevance and whether or not the use is explicitly misleading. Now, generally speaking, satisfying this artistic relevance prong is very easy. And in fact, until a recent case involving the honey badger meme, it was fair to say that you'll always meet that artistic relevance threshold. Now that recent case, I don't think would be a problem in a situation like Call of Duty. It's, an, it's a problem for uh, more extreme cases where there's not much to the product other than the use of the mark. So ordinarily, you'll satisfy the artistic relevance standard. And courts that apply the Rogers test are fairly consistent on that. The problem is with the second prong. When are you explicitly misleading public into thinking that the trademark owner has approved your unauthorized use what <coughs> of the mark. The Ninth Circuit in its most recent cases has said, when we say explicitly misleading, we mean explicitly misleading. You have to have an affirmative statement that misleads people. It can't just be that a lot of people are confused. Now, the ordinary standard in a trademark infringement case is, are consumers likely to be confused about the relationship between the trademark owner and the other user of the mark? Are they likely to be confused? Under the Ninth Circuit's recent case law, it doesn't matter if people are confused. All that matters is, did the unauthorized user say something explicitly misleading? Did it actually say, this is the official Humvee product, or something like that? Some sort of statement that is essentially fraudulent and misleading customers into thinking that it's an officially approved use. Absent that, it's not explicitly misleading. And since you can ordinarily meet the artistic relevance problem without much difficulty, that means that under the recent Ninth Circuit cases, the unauthorized use of a mark in a book or a film or even a video game, because it turns out the key case here is involved in a video game, you're going to be protected under the First Amendment. So out here in the Ninth Circuit, that Call of Duty case should be very easy. And Activision, again, the toy issue is a little more complicated, but at least for the use in the video games, Activision should prevail. I, I, don't, I don't think there's really much there that uh, gives the plaintiff an argument for prevailing under the standard views of the Ninth Circuit. But, well, the Ninth Circuit hasn't been consistent over time. And out in the Second Circuit, they've been doing things a little bit differently. What the Second Circuit says is, first you have to figure out if there's a likelihood of confusion. So we have to go through an expensive process to figure out, is there a likelihood of confusion here? And only after we've established that there's a likelihood of confusion, we ask this question. Is there an unusually high showing of confusion? If there is, then we'll call it explicitly misleading. If there's not, then we'll say it's not explicitly misleading. So in order for the First Amendment to protect the use, you have to show that you don't meet this very big standard of extra confusion beyond what would normally be required in a trademark infringement case. And so that makes things a little more unpredictable out in the Second Circuit. It doesn't mean Activision loses out there, but it means that it's going to take longer and it's a little uncertain, yeah. What's the specific nature of the confusion that you'd have to show? That people were confused about uh, whether Humvee approved the use or whether it's an endorsement, or like, what's the exact like test for working? Um, if I can bring out a...
All right, it's 15 U.S.C. 1125 A1A. <laughs> I guess I should put this into a slide. All right, 15 U.S.C. A1A. It's likely to cause confusion or deceive as to affiliation, connection, association, origin, sponsorship, or approval. Any, any of those six. So it doesn't mean that consumers think that AM General made the game. It doesn't even mean that people think AM General was particularly involved in making the game. But it would be enough for people to believe that AM General approved the use of the mark in the game. That would satisfy the likelihood of confusion standard. Or was connected with it. Yeah, so yeah, saying it's okay I mean, would would probably be a connection, would probably be approval. It's not origin. The origin one here is dropping out. It's probably not relevant in a false endorsement case. Because again, nobody thinks that AM General is gonna make a video game. But if there's an affiliation, connection, association, in theory that's enough to meet the standard of showing false endorsement or false association. These claims come by different names, and that's why at the top of the handout it says, um, false endorsement, unfair competition, false designation of origin. The courts sometimes use different names, but it's all the same basic question. Is there a belief by consumers that it's an approved use? Now, again, there's a problem here, as I suggested earlier, that this isn't really material to anybody's purchasing decision. Now, it is material to me when I go to the store and I try to find the toothpaste I bought last time. So I'm looking for that aqua fresh mark. And I don't want to spend a lot of time reading the back and looking at the addresses and trying to figure out, is this from the same Aquafresh people as the last time I bought it? I just want to see the market buy it. That's very useful. But the idea here that anybody's purchasing decisions are being affected by the approval, not the appearance. The appearance is valuable to people. People want the Humvee in the game. People want realistic military vehicles in the game. That's something I don't doubt for a moment. But the idea that whether it's officially approved matters to consumers, I don't think is remotely plausible. Especially when it comes to military equipment, many people probably don't even realize there's a single source of this military equipment. Now, the Humvee, since there was a civilian model, maybe it's different. But if you think of the Huey helicopter in the Battlefield Vietnam case, I doubt very many people, unless they work at the Pentagon, would even realize, oh, there's one source of this Huey. And I wonder if that one source approved the appearance in the game. But even if a person thought maybe it was approved, and now I watch, I watch shows all the time wondering, oh, was that approved, was that approved, I wonder if that's approved. And I always hope that I can figure this out by watching the credits or listening to the director's commentary. I want to know, is this an authorized use or not? Um, so I'm always curious, and I guess in some sense I'm always confused. But it doesn't affect my purchasing decisions in any way. Because I want to see the Hummer in a military game. But I don't care if AM General said go ahead and do it or extracted some money from Activision to give, to give their permission. In fact, I would hope not because in most cases I don't want some outside entity that may have different agendas than the creator of the work to be able to have a say in what the work looks like. And uh, you know, if you think of Apocalypse Now, for example, that was a movie that um, didn't take very positive view of the Vietnam War, and uh, the company that owned the Hueys didn't want their helicopters in the movie, so they didn't provide them. So they used the Philippine Air Force to get the Hueys for that movie. But if the owners of the Huey IP got to say, you need our permission to do this, then they could veto the movie. And uh, I think that would be very troubling if the owners of the Huey helicopter could shut down a movie that has a message that's not very positive about the current military activities on people's minds. So, meeting the standard may actually be plausible in many of these cases. You know, with the military equipment, I'm not so sure. But I'm guessing that many times when people see a trademark appear in film, they'll probably assume it's product placement. Because a lot of I mean, people know about this. At least, I mean, it's been going on throughout most of the 20th century, but at least since E.T., it's been something people just know happens a lot, and they know it's a pretty big deal. And so people probably assume that many of these uses are licensed, and in fact are confused, yeah. One of my questions, going back to Joe, your point, is when you're asking consumers or gamers about whether or not there's any association between a given product and a given game, what kind of, like, is there any history on what kind of data they're using or what kind of questions they're asking? Because I think if you ask your average casual gamer if there was any kind of 
official endorsement, they probably wouldn't know that something like that would occur. They might know that Burger King sponsored sneaking or that maybe a particular car might be uh, you know, a piece of downloadable content and something like Forza. They might even know that a game like Army of Two uh, is made by the U.S. Army. But is there a way to kind of pose that question to, like in a court of law when we're trying to figure out if there's any association here, are we asking casual gamers, hardcore gamers, what kind of questions are we asking or how are we framing them to kind of answer that? Well, a couple of questions are embedded in there. One is, can I point to any actual survey conducted as part of this litigation? Off the top of my head, I can't. Um, I'm not sure if it got to the point, I vaguely think there might be an example, but I, I can't say what it is off the top of my head. So one question is, do we actually do a survey and what we ask and what it show? As far as the second issue, would consumers be likely to be confused? I think people tend to be very aware of the whole idea of licensed content. I mean, I see people just on, on message boards and blogs and various places show a very high degree of knowledge about the basic idea of licensed IP. There are these licensed games. Oh, they've got the license for Star Wars. Oh, why isn't the Porsche in this driving game? They didn't get the license. It's not a, Porsche didn't improve it. Um, so I, I think uh, it's pretty common for people to have a high degree of awareness of the existence of licensing arrangements. And in some games, it's very obvious, like in driving games, you might look on the back of the box and it might say, license vehicles from the following, and it lists all the various auto manufacturers that have approved the use in the game. Back when you could get the instruction book, there might be a section at the end where it listed licensing language for all the different automakers in the racing games. So I suspect the, the level of confusion is fairly high, and you don't even need a very high level. I mean, you don't need 90% to be confused. You know, double digits is usually good enough, maybe even a little less. So if that's all you need, that's easy. So if there's no First Amendment protection here, then yes, A in general essentially owns at least the video game depictions of war. Now, do they press this argument against TV and filmmakers? There was actually an attempt to get that information from AM General uh, in, uh, in court, and um, the court said no, but the transcript of that discussion hasn't been made available yet. So the, well, I don't know what the judge said in response to Activision's attempt to get from AM General information about, do you do this with film, do you do this with TV, which is what I think they were trying to get at. Because I think, again, I don't have all the, since I can't download everything as part of this discussion, I don't know exactly how this was supposed to play out, but my impression is is that Activision wants to be able to say, look, you know, a lot of times this isn't even used with permission. So the idea that consumers would be confused is, is probably not there because most of the time in the films, you're not even giving a license into it. They're just using it without your permission. I, I wish that the court had made in general produce this information that it could have worked its way onto uh, onto the electronic docket so I could look and see what things AM General has approved in the past. In the complaint, it lists licensing agreements with other video game makers. So they say, we made a deal with this company, this company, this company for these games. So we know AM General has in the past gotten others to get a license from them. And other companies have been successful in getting licenses for military equipment to show up in games as well. All right, I know I'm, uh, gosh, I'm just down five minutes. So um, let me uh, just say a few words about the second case that I think is interesting. So I think this should actually be an easy case. Now, will it end up the way I hope it ends up? I don't know, but it's an important case to watch because we could end up with a very, I think we have a split now, but we could end up with a very clear split of authority between the Second Circuit and the Ninth Circuit on this issue. And maybe that will finally get the Supreme Court interested in this topic. If the Second Circuit says that this is a protected use, that means you'll have the Second Circuit and the Ninth Circuit in agreement on this very important question, because it's a question about whether or not video game makers can do what everybody else can, tell stories that require the use of real world objects, like these things. So it's an important case to watch, and um, you asked for, Raj, you asked for my, my wish. Well, my wish is that this doesn't settle and that we actually end up with a real decision at the end. Because at some point, the video game industry has to get this resolved. They gotta pay for it an hour later. And I understand why they want to move this to the Ninth Circuit, but maybe ultimately the outcome of a split with the Second Circuit will be productive because it will finally force the Supreme Court to answer the question. Unless we get a consistent answer, then you're kind of pushed into licensing anyway, because you always have to worry about this kind of litigation. So I think we need a resolution from the Supreme Court. Maybe this will be the case that prompts that. 
All right, the second case that I think is interesting to watch that's currently in litigation is this one, Hamilton versus Spate. Unlike the first case, I think this one's a little, little tougher. I'm not going to be quite as quick to say I think I know how this case should come out. In this case, though, the argument is that this character here, Coltrane from the Gears of War series, is actually based on the plaintiff, uh, who is a professional wrestler named Hamilton. Hard Rock Hamilton was his name. And the person who does the voice for the Coltrane is named Spate. He's named as a defendant. He knew this person. And the argument is, is that the Coltrane character is supposed to look like him, and that Spate imitated his voice. Now, I won't play the clip now, but uh, the sound system isn't uh, quite working. But he points to the voice. He points to using the derby hat and, I don't know what these are called, these wrist pieces here, and says, well, they do the same for Cole Train in one mode of Gears of War, where you can put him in a derby hat and put these wrist things on. If you want to watch the clip of Hamilton talking to compare the voice, there is a clip on YouTube that you can find by just searching the uh, plaintiff's name. It should come up. He talks in this interview and then you shouldn't have too much trouble finding a clip of Coltrane in Gears of War. The plaintiff actually got a forensic voice examiner to write up a report that actually says, and this, actually, this doesn't look so good for the forensic examiner in my opinion, it says it is the opinion of this examiner based on my education, training, certification, experience, and voice analysis that the Coltrane voice depicted in the Gears of War video game and the voice of Mr. Lenwood Hamilton are the same. Okay, but they're actually not. <laughs> so maybe this is good for the plaintiff, but not good if you're a forensic voice in the analyst, because he even says, I make this opinion to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty. I'm certain it's the same voice. Okay, but it's not. He says it isn't. <laughs> um, so what do we do with this case? Now, my first reaction to this case is that this is like a lot of other cases uh, that have come up recently where the right of publicity claim should not prevail. And I have a handout. You can look at the handout. Um, the handout gives you several categories of how these right of publicity cases generally play out. Here's the really short version. If you're going to use somebody's identity in an advertisement, ordinarily you need permission. Advertisements are the easy cases. If you're going to use somebody's identity in a newspaper article, a film, or a book, ordinarily you don't need permission. In between, there's this gray area involving merchandise, the t-shirts, the coffee mugs. And the question has been, are games in this category, the merchandise category, or over here? The traditional old answer was they're in this category here. And you could look at the leading treatise on trademarks, and McCarthy and trademarks, and see, yeah, games go in the merchandise category. You could look at the old cases involving board games and go, yeah, they're in this category. That means games have to have permission to put a real person in the game. But then along comes Brown and says video games are going to be treated like other forms of media, and it's 410. So, um, oh, you can go to 430 because we started late. Oh, all right. Well, I don't want to keep people past the expected time, so I'll wrap it up. If there are questions, I'm happy to answer those. But um, it sounds like games should be over here, thanks to Brown. But the cases decided post-Brown, although they'd say that, that now games are in this category here, they'd still find for the plaintiffs. Now, those involve sports games. Sports games are different. The courts didn't do a good job of explaining why, but maybe they are. Maybe they're different than more narrative-oriented games. And we really don't have any cases about just plopping a real person unchanged into a narrative game. The one case we have involves Manuel Noriega, and since he's viewed as a bad guy, he loses the case just because he's a bad guy. Not because the doctor says he should lose. The court could, it would have been more, I think, more forthcoming if the court had just said he's a bad guy, he's going to lose. Uh, <laughs> because doctrinally, he had a good argument based on the California cases uh, that were uh, supposed to be controlling there. But the question is, what do we do with somebody in this situation who claims that character is based on me? Now, based on this chart, you might say, well, if I think it goes in this category over here, where you can put a real person into a television program and tell a story about them, I should think this is an easy case. The problem is this. The reason why I think this case is a little more interesting is this. There is a limitation on this category, at least insofar as it interferes with the First Amendment. The Supreme Court has said in its only right of publicity case, that if you take an entire person's act in a human cannonball case, that's not protected by the First Amendment, even if it's news reporting. So what if you're not taking somebody's entire act, but you're taking somebody who might be an actor? Now, this person's a professional wrestler, has been working as an actor, but what if you digitally reproduce an actor 
such that now you don't have to hire the actor anymore. That could undermine the ability of actors to find work actors to pursue their career. We, that could be a problem. So, well, if they're alive, at least. If they're deceased, this issue goes away. But if they're alive and you can just digitally recreate The Rock and make a new movie without paying The Rock, because he charges a lot of money. So I'll just digitally reproduce him, hire a voice impersonator, and put him in the movie that way. Well, that might run into this as a keen problem. And then the question becomes, is this years of war case, is this a Zucchini-like case? That's why I think it's an interesting case, and that's why I think it's one that's worth watching. It's a little different than the Grand Theft Auto cases, where we had a character inserted into the game as a sort of parody, and the court didn't think it really looked like her. It probably was Lindsay Lohan, but it's still a parody. This isn't really a parody. Maybe this is forcing somebody to be an actor in a situation where the person didn't want to be an actor. I don't know. But I think that's why this case might be interesting to watch. All right, I'll stop there. And uh, it's 413, yes? So I had a quick question related a bit more to the Humvee case you were talking about earlier. And maybe this is just so I can get a better understanding of exactly how that process works when asking for permission for uh, brands to be a part of, whether it's games or movies or whatever, for example. So if you're using your own, so for example, I've purchased a Humvee, and I have that, and I make a film using that Humvee. Does that, do, if I were to sell that movie, ideally, would I, the, you know, if I were to try to do everything by the numbers as well as possible, would I have to ask Humvee for this to be a part of that, even though it's my property? Just a, well, the fact that it's your property isn't really part of the analysis here. It's good to know. The question is, would consumers be confused into thinking that Humvee approved the appearance in the film that you're selling? Gotcha. And would it be a false endorsement situation? Uh, as the chart shows, not the color chart, but the other one, media defendants have usually won these cases. And there are some cases involving vehicles. There's one involving the Caterpillar tractors, for example. But they don't always win the cases, the media defendants, in a way that will deter the next plaintiff from filing the case. Because courts aren't consistent in giving a reason why the media defendant wins. Sometimes, like in the Caterpillar case, the court will just say, we don't think consumers are going to be confused here. We don't think they'll think the Caterpillar approved this appearance. I doubt that, but since it didn't decide it on First Amendment grounds, it invites the next plaintiff to show up and say, well, this time it is confusing. So the courts are kind of all over the place, as that chart suggests. And even when they claim to follow the same test, they don't always. I said the Ninth Circuit hasn't been consistent. In fact, in one case, the one involving uh, Grand Theft Auto San Andreas, the court described the test that's relevant here, the Rogers versus Grimaldi test, in terms that basically stripped it of any value. Even though the media defendants still won, the court basically turned the Rogers versus Grimaldi First Amendment test into nothing more than asking, is there a likelihood of confusion? They didn't quite say that, but if you looked at the analysis, that's all they did was say, well, we don't think it's confusing for these reasons. Then the later case says, we don't care if it's confusing, we want to know if it was explicitly misleading. So the later case is clear. There's First Amendment protection unless you make an affirmative statement that's misleading. <clears throat> so in your hypothetical involving I bought a car and I stick in a movie, uh, my guess would be if it's a film, there's less likely to be a lawsuit. It's not guaranteed there might be caterpillar involved in film. But video games, because they've traditionally been treated as merchandise, are more attractive because the courts are going to view them skeptically and think, you know, you're just selling merchandise here. This isn't legitimate. If you're sticking uh, a Hummer in this, then you're just trying to free ride on AM General's goodwill. A court's more likely to say it there than in a film. In a film, they're more likely to find a way to find for the media defendant. Now, but video game producers do still win some of these cases, but there are a couple out there that are kind of bad, and every now and then the courts say things that invite another case, especially in the video game context. So that we need a consistent statement that provides a clear rule. Otherwise, people are gonna feel compelled in many situations to just get the license. Because this, this case is not on a point to the right slide, but the AM general case, since it's gonna involve going through the full discovery process, is gonna add up to a lot of money, because they couldn't get rid of this case early on because the Second Circuit wants to know, first, what's the likelihood of confusion? Let's go through the whole rigmarole to figure that out, and then we'll see if you make a particularly compelling showing of confusion in order to prevail in the First Amendment interest. So, and maybe then this is part of the whole process that I, that I, that the court has to go through. Does that likelihood of confusion have to do with the artistic approach to how, you know, let's say an item is put in there? So for example, there was a, a show recently 
I think, it, I don't know if it was This Is Us or something related to that, where a crock pot started to fire. And that crock pot was in this really pivotal scene that killed one of the really popular characters. And crock pot was really upset about how it was portrayed, as saying crock pots don't catch fire, we don't do this, this is crazy. But hypothetically, if it were, you know, in the background, it happened to be, you know, and not necessarily a big part of that, it does it, they're less, I imagine, less, less likely to come off. Well, if you look at the leading treatise on clearance issues that uh, many people rely on in Hollywood, it's called Copyright Clearance, so there's a section on trademark. It says, here's what you should do. Feel free to use marks, but don't misuse them. <laughs> because if you misuse them, now, it kind of implies that this creates a legal problem, and I think they don't quite state this correctly. But I, I, if you read it as more of a practical suggestion, it's this. If you misuse the product, you're more likely to invite a lawsuit. So in the TV show Heroes from many years ago, in the very first episode, the cheerleader sticks her hand into the garbage disposal, turns it on, takes out her hand, it's all mangled, and then like Wolverine, she heals. Um, there was a lawsuit over that. Because if you watched the first episode of Heroes on a big TV, high definition, paused at just the right moment, you'd see the insincorator mark on the garbage disposal. And the insincorator people saw it, and they think a lot of other people saw it too, and then became upset and sued NBC over it. So rather than pursue that to the end, NBC said, fine, we'll just digitally remove it. So if you have a DVD set of season one, you will not be able to see the insincorator mark if you stop it at just the right moment. But it was there originally. Yeah. So just a question on remedies, because I'm, I'm, I mean, I understand that in practice that, that when these cases happen, they want to seek an injunction to stop the bridge or whatever. Is the damage that is reimbursable to, to the, the Humvee people, is it equivalent to the price that, they, that Activision would have had to pay for a license to put it in the game, or is it a un unjust enrichment kind of this is the benefit to your game that like is there a way to quantify the benefit? I'm curious how damages are actually quantified, assuming that it ever gets to that point. Yeah, um, gosh, I, I can't think of a case involving false endorsement where it actually got that far. There are some right publicity cases that actually got the damages calculation, and that may be one reason why this case is going forward right now with uh, you know. If, I think a law firm that looks like they're pretty together, why they take on this case? Well, maybe it's because in some of these right publicity cases, the damages judgments have been so enormous. The Michael Jordan case, the, um, the uh, what's his name, the hockey player, uh, that showed up in the spot, Tony Twist. Tony Twist, the judgment in that case was you know, over $10 million. It was originally like $25 million and reduced to like 16 or something like that. So in some of these right publicity cases, the number has been big. In the trademark context, um, I, I, I assume if I went back and looked at the complaint, they're asking for everything at this point. Um, would that be more than just a, a licensing fee? I would guess it probably would be. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head if willfulness gets you a, an extra multiplier here in the, in the Lanham Act. Does. Even, even does. so, though. Yeah, all right, so that, that's one answer here. They're going to argue willfulness. In fact, they're arguing that, that um, well, they're going to argue willfulness. Sure. It's even also so, basically like, possible willfulness in the night circuit, which may be another reason they're trying to transfer it. Oh, okay. Well, because it seems, it seems to me like in a lot of these cases, the, the license that you would pay to let's say the gun manufacturer, would be like nothing, you know, you know or, or just a minimal amount because the gun manufacturers benefit from having their gun appear in the game. And it's just, if I was, I mean, obviously I'm sure they tried this, but if you were trying to settle the suit, you would say, look, you were only harmed the price that we would have given you for a, a, a license fee. And any other sort of theory of damages kind of almost tanks your whole argument. Because if you're saying that this was an, that my game, you know, hurts you, then then you're really actually saying that like it's you're you're claiming a different right of action. You're saying that this is actually like trademark disparagement. No. Like it's just interesting to me, like the it seems almost backwards when you think about it. Well, uh, I suppose could become quite costly if they get some sort of injunction here. Right, that's, that's why they go for it. Yeah, it, it, to shut down the game so they can resolve this or something like that. That, that might be, it's like if, if you can get the injunction before the movie's released. Right. right. So, 
Well, and after it's been gotten to date, right? You have to wait for it to get to date, and then you sue and hope that before the release you get an injunction, then you get a big payday. Um, I don't know. I'd have to go back and, and look at it a little more carefully and think about it a little bit longer to think about this remedies question and what they might get out of this. I, I should have a better answer, but I don't have a better answer. I just, I don't think that, I've never seen any case. Did you want to add something here? Oh, yeah. I want a separate question. And I, I mean, yeah, so. One of the things theoretically Humvee could argue is they like could point to their past licensing agreements and say, look, whenever in the past we have licensed the Humvee name, it has always been fought for 5% of uh, gross revenue, period. I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm, this, this might be the case. Maybe they can point to their past licensing agreements and say we get 5% of that gross revenue. Thus, the uh, damages are what we would license to pay for 5% of the revenue, right? Maybe they have a licensing agreement, something like that. So that is what I would do if I were them, uh, possibly. Um, but they can often choose the higher of their actual damages and what the license would have been because the actual damages are the license you were not paid. But damages are very, very tough in trademark cases because how do you prove it? Yeah. But the injunction, if you get the injunction, it's all, also worth money. If you can win the injunction and, and it's a great, um, it's going to cost you X millions of dollars to change the game and do this and do that. So instead, just pay us you know, 90% of X. Are current courts moving away from a lot of injunctions in cases like this and just presuming that monetary value associated with the licensing is good enough? Well, they I know it's not. They're not supposed to just presume irreparable harm anymore. Now, I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know if that's had a practical effect on the number of injunctions issued. I would, I would guess it's probably slowed some down. But it used to be, if it's an IP case, when you're going through the list of factors to think about as to whether an injunction should issue, you just assume presume irreparable harm. And now you have to actually say something about it. Because in the old days, basically it was just can you show a likelihood of success on the merits and the other factors just sort of fall in place. And the Supreme Court made that a little harder. So, yeah. I have a quick question for you. So, well, a common question. So earlier you were talking about the rock and if he's dead, you don't have to worry about it anymore. But no, 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 that, no, I'm not saying you don't have to worry about it anymore from a legal standpoint. I meant as far as the incentives argument. Oh, first, right, right. right. I just meant as far as the rationale yeah. It's not as big an issue for a deceased actor because deceased actors can't be deterred from going into acting or something like that. that so I, I did not mean that once an actor dies, the right to publicity ceases. That depends on state law, and it varies. And so, yes. So yeah. So sorry. Uh, my other question was, uh, and I'd love to hear your opinion on this. Is this not something I've heard anyone else talk about? Is so there's this issue on the right. So you have video games in the middle paragraph. Or the middle no, I left them off. Okay, uh, well, often courts consider them in the middle column, yeah. right? Traditionally, they were in the middle yeah. column. And we're trying to get them moved, I think, to the column on the right, generally speaking. Um, people in the studio are like, no, we're expressive works, we get yeah. personal protection. We Citing want, Brown. We want to be in, in the far right column. One interesting side effect of that would, I think, could possibly be that they really no longer receive very much trademark protection. Because once you're in the far right column, Books and movies don't receive trademark protection for their titles unless they are incredibly famous, like Harry Potter. If you just use one book or one movie, you don't get trademark protection over it. That's why we see so many movies with the same name. So if we are moving video games over to the far right column, are we now losing the ability to protect the trademark of video game titles? Because traditionally, the only reason we were able to get trademark protection for video game titles is because they're seen as games, they're seen as merchandise. I was just talking with someone about that earlier this week, and I have I can't prove anything, but here's my theory. They started off as computer software, just like your word processor, just like paint, just like whatever else. And those are uh, those are clearly products you buy, and they used to come on a disc, but whatever. And so we have no trademark problems with Microsoft Word or Photoshop being trademarks. And that's where they came out of. And that's what they were for the longest time. And and now the momentum just maintains we've itself. gotten to the point where it's they're much more like movies or books or whatnot. But because that's where they came out of, it's just what it's gonna be. I, so that's the inertia argument for this. I'd love to hear other opinions on that, but that that's kind of my take on that. It's funny, I was just talking about this with somebody well, earlier. Just move it by classes. So say an example of Harry Potter, say that if you had a Harry Potter video game, you might lose the trademark protection in the video game. You might not have it for the title of the, of the book, but what about for other classes where you've got merchandise like t-shirts, 
coffee mugs, board games, uh, any other products associated with that? Could you not have a trademark on a video game if we put it in the right column? Well, I'd like to have board games in the right column too. All of these are <laughs> merchandise based thereof. Um, I mean, if you've got a series, you can. So for your series, you would you know your Hardy Boys, your Harry Potter, whatever. Um, for titles, uh, you know, I haven't thought of this before. This is an interesting question. Uh, since I guess my initial instinct, even though I'm not quite sure how this all plays out, is that if film producers can live in a world like this, then so can video game producers. Um, but if you're actually offering like an online service to play the game, that makes it more complicated. So I, I think it's a really interesting question. I'm not, I've never thought about it before. It's almost like I guess I should. Question. How many games are there that come out that might become films that might, you know, genre genre, but then you also have all that tie-in merchandise, you've got the toys, you've got the lunch boxes, you've got everything else, you know, could, you, could we live in a world where Overwatch would not be trademarkable as a brand for a video game or a movie, but for all of the books, toys, or for online other services, services offered video games, <laughs> or that, yeah, I'd like to be at the place where you can get crap in your head from somewhere else. Well, we are over time, did you want to say a final word, Ross, or should, should I say a final word? <laughs> um, I, I always ask the hard question right at the buzzer, just to <laughs> put it back for next year. Um, but I will say, everyone, this has been our fourth CBGLS. I'm super stoked with all of the participation, all of the questions, all of the amazing topics that we've covered here today. I'm very excited to have all this on video for posterity so that we can all come back to it and revisit this. I would love to do another CBGLS next year, so definitely stay tuned. Uh, definitely follow us on Twitter at CBGLS and on our website where we'll be posting videos and photos from today. But in the meantime, thank you so much for coming out and fill out some uh, evaluations of this programming if you'd like to see more like it at CBGLS. Help me thank our speakers uh, and the Chicago Bar Association.